know what they believe. And when the time comes for you to give account by yourself, you need to be able to know. So let's just pray once again. Father, as we reflect upon this word, on your word, and I pray, Lord, that you guide my thoughts, help me to speak clearly, and also with certainty and conviction in my heart. I pray and I thank you. In the name of the Lord Jesus, amen. Now, the purpose of my sermon is this. To learn, I want you to learn, or I want you to review, to learn if the atonement was finished at the cross. All right? Why are you going to talk about this? Some Bible commentators say that Jesus was only a spirit or a vision. But John, the, the passage that we read, John writes strongly in this letter, First John, saying that Jesus was both fully man and fully God. He said that. All right? Fully man and fully God. And then, if Jesus was not fully man, then his death would have no meaning, and Jesus could not offer himself as a sacrifice for our sin. All right? I want you to know this very well. And then he said here, First John 1, 4, we read, John called Jesus the word of life <coughs> at the beginning of uh, the reading. The eternal life was manifest to us. That's what is said in here. It said, in the, you, we read it, isn't it? The word of life was manifest to us. And then he said, John and the other apostles saw Jesus with their own eyes. You and I, we haven't seen Jesus by our own eyes. We just see Jesus through the word of God, all right? Through his word. And then we need to believe it. They touch him. John touched Jesus with their own hands. So those people those who, who were denying that the Lord Jesus was a human, Paul, I mean, John is telling them, yes, but I touched him. I was with him. I saw him with my own eyes. He's given testimony. Jesus was not a spirit because people were saying Jesus was a spirit or a vision. John is saying, no, it's not a vision. I touch him. John touched Jesus not only before his death, but also after Jesus risen from the dead. Can you remember this? All right. But those whom this letter was sent have never seen and heard about Jesus. See, when we need to present the Bible study to a person who never hear about God, we need to be very careful because a person needs to be very slowly brought into the knowledge of the Bible. The person needs to understand and believe the Bible because in the Bible is written the Word of God. And then if that person never has been exposed to the Word of God, we need to guide it very slowly. Try to be clear that the person needs to have confidence in the Bible. See, when somebody was teaching to me about the Bible, the first thing I need to learn that I come into my mind for me was conviction. When I was reading the Bible, I became to convict in my mind that this is the Word of God. That's the first thing that you need to learn, to be convicted here. Because if you read it as another book, you are not convicted here. If you are not convicted here, you are not going to be able to obey it. But you need to be convicted here in your mind. And then when I was convicted in my mind, I began to trust it. You need to trust the word of God. And when you trust the word of God, and then you are convinced. You follow the principle. Now, but to say sometimes we, we are not revealing in our life those principles ourselves. In verse 5, John said that God is light. All right? God is light. Light stands for holiness. Light stands for righteousness. Dark stands for sin and evil. So if God is light, if you believe in the word of God, if you make a mistake, you do something, you need to say sorry. You need to apologize. You need to correct yourself. Is it? 
because there is no one perfect, not even one. So you see, yo said that God is light. In verse 6, to have fellowship with God in the same chapter, God, fellowship with God means to know, to love Jesus, and to be his children. Now we are studying about love God with all your heart and love your neighbor as yourself. Now the question that I ask, do you love your neighbor? Some people say yes. Some maybe you are, sometimes it's difficult to love your neighbor. Especially if your neighbor is a pain in the neck. Tell you, it's not an issue. And I've been living with neighbors, pine in the neck. Church members who are pine in the neck too. I, I will tell you the truth. Right? And then as a pastor, you need to learn how to love that person in the church. So in my ministry, if I tell you everything, I will have you here all day. But I need to pray, Lord, help me to love my sister and my brother who is a pain in the neck for me. And when this particular person asks you, Pastor, can, I, you, can you come in and visit me? You need to go with a willing heart and happy. And then they ask you, can you pray for me? You need to pray for the person. That's what it means to have fellowship with God. It means to know, to love Jesus, and to be his children. You need to act like the Lord Jesus. When Jesus was crucified, what he said? Forgive them because they don't know what they are doing. We need to have the same attitude. Those who walk in darkness and in sin can have no fellowship with Jesus. They speak lies. If we truly have fellowship with Jesus, we will walk in the light. We will speak the truth. Now, in this particular section, uh, speak the truth, no matter if it's difficult for you. Tell the truth. Tell the truth. Do not tell white liars. God knows that. We need to tell the truth. If you make a mistake, you need to recognize. Full stop. The true is no something one speak. Listen very careful. True is something one does and live. You need to live the truth. You see? We must live by the truth. My word is true, Jesus said. True is a way of life, Jesus said. I am the way and the truth and the life. This is the way we need to live. So if we're planning to grow as a Christian, we need to follow these principles. But those principles are there for us to apply to ourselves, not to somebody else. When you read it, apply to you. When we walk in the light, that's where I take the title, in fellowship with Jesus, two things happen. When we walk in the light, two things happen. Here they are. We have fellowship with one another. All right? The blood of Jesus purifies us from our sins. Okay? These are the two things that are going to happen. John also said that we must confess our sin and turn from them. If you offend somebody, better you apologize in the first moment or you apologize one time later. But you need to. And then if you did something wrong to somebody, you need to go and Talk to the person, you person. You need to follow the principle. The Bible. If somebody offends you, what do you need to do? You need to gossip in around? No. You need to go to the person and say, Pastor, you did something wrong for me. And I need to say, Oh, I didn't mean that. And then you need to explain. Or if somebody say, You offended me, well, you need to say, Sorry, what well, I was intended. You need to clarify. But we need to confess. So that's the way we are going to grow spiritually in harmony. We need to understand what is John meaning here. 
John is talking about repentance. We need to repent of something that we did wrong. It is not enough to merely confess our sin with our lips. Anybody can confess with your lips. We must also confess then with our actions. Are you clear? If we confess our sin, God is faithful and just. Why John say that? The Lord is sure to forgive if men will truly confess. Now, in the lesson, the rich drunk ruler knew about what he sincere when we were asking the question to Jesus. He was not. He came in with the intention to test Jesus. But Jesus read his heart, isn't it? And the Lord Jesus read your heart, and the Lord Jesus read my heart. True? So that's why we need to speak the truth all the time. Faithfulness is one of the Lord's outstanding qualities. God is faithful all the time. No matter what you do, he remains faithful to you. But when you do something wrong to me, maybe I'm not going to remain faithful to you. This is the human nature. But then we need to be changed a nature by the Holy Spirit. All right? So we need to act as God acts. God is a true judge and his justice is fair. Are you agree with that? We make some judgment wrong. But God is not going to make any wrong judgment. I want you to understand this. If we confess our sins, some people say they have not sinned. Some people say, have you ever sinned? No, I never sinned. But every person knows in his heart that he has sinned sometime. Is it true? We need to recognize this. God speaks to us about our sin through our consciences. I was very nervous today just to share this thing with you. If anyone sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus the righteous. Because if we do something wrong, we need to confess and also talk to the person if we offend somebody. We all know that Jesus came to this world because he was God initiated to save us. Is it true? Did you ask the Lord Jesus to come to save you? Who he has said to the Lord, I want you to come in and save me. Did you say that? No. God came to this world, or Jesus came to this world because it was God's initiative to save us. All right? No one asked him to come. Jesus went to the cross, not because we human requested. It was God's grace. Do you believe that? It is also true that Jesus resurrected without us asking him to resurrect it. True? This is the plan of salvation. We never request anything. God did it. That's why we are saved by grace. I preach one Sabbath that to save us, Jesus went through several steps that are explaining in the sanctuary. I hope that you remember. Maybe not. Jesus lived among us as a perfect life first, isn't it? Second, in the altar of the sacrifice, Jesus died for us. See? This is the sanctuary, all right? And then in the labor, Jesus resurrected. And all these steps happen here on earth. I want you to remember, all this is that Jesus lived among us here on earth. In the altar of the sacrifice, Jesus died for us here on earth. And in the life of Jesus, resurrect here and then. And then when he resurrected, where he went? He went to heaven. Where is he now? In heaven. What he's doing? We, you need to be very sure. We all need to know what the Lord Jesus is doing in heaven on your behalf. We need to know this. All right? And then he said, these three steps, Jesus did it for all human rights that ever lived. So Jesus did all these three ones for every person that who live on earth. Are you understanding this? I want you to be clear because I'm going to put another few things here now. These steps were pure God initiative. These three steps, only God initiative. Everything was God initiative. Yeah, I have nothing to do with human choice. You have nothing to all these things. You have nothing to do with human choice. God initiative. 
I want you to follow close because I'm going to say what part is your initiative now. And it said here, but when Jesus ascended to heaven, he began a work of intercession for us. True? These three steps that I mentioned to you happen here on earth. All the things that Jesus is doing now is happening where? In heaven. Now. Listen careful now. This aspect, the thing that Jesus is doing in heaven, or Jesus' work, have to do with our choice. Your choice, my choice. With my response, your response. How are you going to respond about Jesus now? What he's doing in heaven. That's what I'm going to. By shedding the blood of the Son of God, he had uprooted himself from the sympathy of the heavenly being. Yet Satan was not then destroyed. The angel did not even then understand all that was involved in the great controversy. The angel didn't even understand. And then he said, the principle as stay were to be more fully revealed. And for the sake of men's sight and existence must be continued. Sight and is still alive. Do you know that? It hasn't been destroyed. It's been defeated. But it's not been destroyed. So Satan is still tempting you, is tempting me to do the wrong things. Are you aware of this? Men as well as angels must see the contrast between the prince of light and the prince of darkness. We must choose whom we will serve. This is our part. We need to choose whom we are going to obey, who we are going to follow. The work of Jesus in the holy and most holy place have to do with man's choice. <coughs> do you agree about this? It's your choice now. What are we? Let me explain. I'm not going to drink all this. Let me explain this. It said here, some people <coughs> believe that the atonement finished at the cross. All right? Whatever Jesus did, finished all at the cross. <coughs> One Bible student that argued the atonement finished at the cross was a Seventh-day Adventist. Did you know that? This man said that we Adventists are wrong in saying that Jesus went to heaven to perform a work of atonement because everything finished at the cross. Follow me close now. Ellen White, in her writing, talked about this issue. If the atonement finished at the cross, sometimes she writes just the atonement finished at the cross. Sometimes it seems that she is saying that the atonement finished at the cross. Every follow me about the atonement, what is atonement? What Jesus did for us, all right? In other statements, she said that Jesus went to heaven to complete the work of the atonement. Now, which one is true? Let me say. Because of this, some accuse Mrs. White that there is some contradiction in her writings. The contradictions is in the mind of a careless and superficial student about her writing and the scripture. I'm going to prove it. When we look at Ellen G. White's statement within the context, we will find that there is no contradiction. So I'm going to read two statements now. In, in the first statement, she said that the atonement finished at the cross. Okay? In the second statement that I'm going to read, she said that Jesus went to heaven to complete his work of atonement. Everybody's clear? Don't go to sleep. If you are sleeping, don't go to sleep. The first statement, when upon the cross, Jesus cried out, it is finished. Jesus addressed the Father. The compact had been fully carried out. Now Jesus declared, Father, it is finished. I have done thy will, O oh my God. I have completed the work of redemption. You see, she's saying that the atonement finished. At the cross. You see it? Can you see it? Yeah. 
If this justice is satisfied, I will that they also whom thou hast given me be with me where I am. So I took this from the desire of the ages. All right? So you got the book, you can read it and check. This is the first statement. She's saying here that the atonement finished at the cross. All right? Now the second statement. Listen very careful. The intercession of, of, of Christ in men's behalf in the sanctuary above is as essential to the plan of salvation as was his death upon the cross. Where is Jesus now? In heaven. He's interceding for, and then she said that what Jesus is doing on behalf of you and behalf of me in the heavenly sanctuary is essential to the plan of salvation. We should not ignore what the Lord Jesus is doing at the moment. We need to know where is him and what he's doing. And then he said, by his death, Jesus began that word which after his resurrection, Jesus ascended to complete in heaven. You see, the atonement didn't finish at the cross, she said. But it's still going on in heaven. Because he's interceding for you and for me. Are you understanding this? Yes? Yes. We must, by faith, she said, enter within the veil. Whether the forerunner is for us, enters. The great controversy said this. So Jesus is still doing the work of interceding for every person. All right. Now, why am I saying this? In the last statement, she said that Jesus started his work of redemption here on earth and went to heaven to complete it. All right? That's what I'm trying to prove. Jesus went to heaven to represent those who come to him within the veil. Now Jesus is there waiting for me to go and ask the Lord Jesus, yes, I believe that you died for me in the cross, but I want you to put all the benefit in my behalf. And this is the action that you need to do personal now. I need to do it personal. Even when Jesus died for me, but then and now I need to go and reclaim those benefits myself as a person. Do you believe that? Or maybe, I, you, do you understand what I'm saying? And anyway, in this statement, it's talking about man response. And we need to respond now. The Lord Jesus died in the cross, fine. He made provision for you and for me to be saved in the cross, isn't it? He made provision. But now I need to ask and say, Jesus... I want you to put your life, your perfect life on my behalf. I want you to put your perfect death in my behalf. You, you understand? I want to climb the benefit. We need to climb the benefit in our behalf. Because if we don't climb, you think you are fully, be careful, don't fool yourself. Because you need to personally come to the Lord Jesus and say, I want to be your child too. All right? She continues, there the light from the cross of cover is reflected in the heavenly. There we might gain a clear insight into the mystery of redemption. The salvation of men is accomplished at an infinite expense to heaven. Read it carefully. The sacrifice made is equal to the brother's demand of the broken law of God. Jesus has opened the way to the Father's throne and through his mediation, the sincere desire of all who come to him in faith might be present before God. We need to come in faith before him, is it? You remain silent now. It's too difficult? It is clear? Yes? All right. To help us to understand these two statements, I will ask a question. Did Jesus forgive the sin of each individual at the cross. <coughs> don't, you don't need to answer. Some people say yes. I know you will say yes, but the answer is wrong. I'm going to explain why. Jesus, by his righteous life and death for sin, made sufficient provision. I, wa I want you to remember this word. Jesus made provision at the cross to forgive the sin of every person that lives in this world. Do you believe that? Jesus made provision for everybody. All right? 
but this provision must be personally climbed. You need to climb personally. That's why it is important that if you listen to a preacher here in 30 minutes or 20 minutes, whatever we use it, we cannot explain everything to you. You need to read your Bible. You need to believe in the Lord Jesus. You need to make a decision yourself. You need to say, Jesus, I want to belong to you. I want to give a personal testimony, a public testimony. I belong to you. I want you to be my ch your child. And then you need to be baptized. You cannot just keep on living without being baptized. But you need to make, you need to start thinking about that you are believing in the Lord Jesus, that you want to be close to the Lord Jesus, that you want to be living with him eternally. And by living in him eternally, you need to give some step that is telling you us we need to do. When the sinner repented, confessed his sin, trust in Jesus, and is baptized, Jesus takes his perfect life and his death for sin and implanted those benefits into the sinner account. Do you believe? You understand what he's saying? Do you understand what I'm saying? You need to do a personal decision. That's the point. A personal decision needs to come from you that you want this for you, that you want to prepare yourself, and you're going to just say, I've been attending church, or I've been doing so many years, but I haven't done the step to be baptized. Because the Bible says, everyone who is baptized is belong to the kingdom. Is it? Mark, you need to read Mark. And God said, when you do this step, when the sinner repents, when the sinner confesses his sin, when the sinner trusts in Jesus, and then it makes a decision to be baptized, Jesus takes his perfect life and his death for sin and implanted those benefits into the sinner's account. And God looked upon that sinner as if he had never sinned. But then you need to make that step. It is the, the marvelous grace of God in making us his own children. The Bible said that God has freely given us this glorious grace even when we don't, didn't do anything to earn it. It's given to us, but then you need to want it. But if you don't want it, it's not going to be any benefit for you. Do you understand what I'm saying? Yeah. I think uh, all of you have been baptized, so it's important that you remember this. So God has given us this grace through the one he loved. Who is the one he loved? Jesus. All those benefits has been given to us through the Lord Jesus. It is in Jesus that we have redemption. Our life is centered in Jesus. Yes? Every kind of spiritual blessing is in Jesus. All power is also in Jesus. So we need to uplift Jesus all the time because he is the one. Jesus died on the cross in order to take upon himself the punishment of sin. But then when he took the punishment of sin, you need to say, Jesus, I want you to put all your righteousness upon me. You need to believe in the sacrifice he did and then you need to say publicly that you believe it. You need to make that decision. All right? And this is something that we pastor sometimes we don't explain to people when we are given Bible study. As his ascension, Jesus went to the holy place to do his work of interceding for whom? He's interceding for those who repent confess their thing, trust in Jesus as a personal Savior, and are baptized. All right? Very important. Now you, some people might say, what about the thief on the cross? He was not baptized. Of course he was not. Why he was not baptized? Because he was nailed to the cross. Are you nailed to the cross? You are not nailed to the cross. But if you are not nailed to the cross, he will do what Jesus was requesting, isn't it? But he was nailed to the cross. And Jesus, he believed in the Lord Jesus. The condition that he was there, he couldn't uh, give the, him the chance to go to be baptized. But Jesus said, I'm going to impute to you my righteousness because you have set me. And in that condition that you are, you cannot do anything, but I give it to you. But then you are no nailed to the cross. So you need to think about this particular one. 
repent, confess their sin, trust in Jesus as a person. You need to look that you want Jesus to be your personal Savior for you. That's why we are not going to be saving group. We are saving personal. Your relationship with the Lord Jesus yourself only. And then you make the decision to be baptized because you want to belong. This is the beginning that you are... To be baptized is not the end. To be baptized is the beginning of the Christian life. Because you are saying in public now that you want to follow the Lord Jesus and you want to live with the principle. At the moment you are not doing that, you are living according to your way of life. But then you need to live according to what Jesus is telling you to live. I'm explaining myself clear. All these things are individual choices. The thing that I, all this here are individual's choice. No one is going to repent from you. No one is going to confess the thing that you have made, made in life for you. No one is going to trust in Jesus for you. No one is going to be baptized on your behalf. It's all personal. Do you believe that? It's all personal. And then when you do those personal, all these things are individual choices. This is how we need to respond when we accept Jesus as a personal Savior. All right? And then he said, in a nutshell, first, God's work of redemption is only his initiative. All right? Only by his grace without a request. But Jesus' perfect life, but Jesus' perfect death, but Jesus' perfect resurrection is something that we need to want for ourselves as individuals. Do you understand? As in the, you need to want those things for you. If we don't believe and accept Jesus' sacrifice by faith, all what Jesus did will have no value for you. This is clear? It's difficult to understand? This is clear. How many people don't even think or don't even want to accept Jesus as their personal Savior? Do you know? There are many of them. They say, oh, I don't want to know about Jesus. I don't believe in his sacrifice. This is only children's story. But the provision is there for them too, for those one who don't believe it. The provision is there. All right? Faith in the sacrifice of Jesus is necessary. Even in the Old Testament, we read that Abraham and David repented. They confessed their sin and had faith in Jesus even when they were looking forward. All right? The Old Testament people were looking to the future Redeemer. Do you understand this? And we in the New Testament now, we are looking back to Jesus as the one who already paid for our sin. Do you understand that? Yeah. Old Testament people and New Testament people need to appropriate or, or accept individually the provision that Jesus made to benefit them. Do you understand that? One, pas one passage that will help us to understand what I'm saying is John 3.16. Come on, tell me. John 3.16 by memory. For God so loved the world that he, whoever believed in him might not perish but have everlasting life. Listen, careful now. But I want you to be careful now. Be aware here. He said, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. All right? I stop there. By his love, grace, and mercy, God sent his son so Jesus lived a perfect life on earth. Jesus died for our sin here. Jesus resurrected. Are you following me? Yes. For what reason all these things happened? For what reason? For that whosoever believe in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. This is the second part of the verse. All the things here happen for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. For what reason? For who, whoever believe in him. In him should not perish, but have everlasting life. So it's a part, personal choice here that you need to make that step. Do you understand what I'm saying? Yes. Before I finish, let me tell you about Jesus' resurrection. 
But if there is no resurrection, we were discussing in, in the Sabbath school. You know, resurrection of the dead, then Christ is no reason. And if Christ is no reason, then a preaching, what I'm doing here is empty, and your faith is also vain. Yes, and we have found false witness of God because we have testified of God that he rise up Jesus whom he did not rise up, because there were discussion in the, in the New Testament of people saying Jesus didn't resurrect it. He was taken by the disciples. In fact, it is, the dead do not rise, because Paul is defending. Jesus rise for an intention to be interceding for you. But some people were denying this. And then Paul is trying to express that Jesus rise. If he didn't rise, it's no benefit for us, you see? And Paul is making the argument, if Jesus didn't rise, then our faith is vain. If Jesus didn't rise, our preaching is nothing. Because we are preaching to a, a dead person. But our preaching is valid because we are preaching to a person who is alive. Is it? Jesus. For if the dead do not rise, Paul continues, then Christ is no reason. And if Christ is no reason, your faith is futile, you are still in your sin. So we are here for nothing. But then we, we, need to, we can testify that Jesus rise from the dead and he's interceding for us. Isn't it? We believe that. Does the resurrection of Jesus have anything to do with our sin being forgiven? Of course. The resurrection is important. All right? Death does not take care of our sin. Jesus had to resurrect it to take care of our sins. Jesus' resurrection is the proof of his power to say amen. Because if he remained dead, we are fertile. Nothing, no hope for us. But he resurrected, he's alive. That's why when people say, what is the difference between you or the other uh, belief? Well, the other people believe in Muslim, the other people believe in Mahoma, the other people believe in this. They are all dead. That's the answer. They are all dead. Jesus is alive. So we are worshiping a living Christ who is able to forgive, and then we need to accept him because he is there to save us, as interceding for us if we come into him. Romans 4, 25, who was delivered up because of offenses and was raised because of justification. There are so many verses in the Bible telling that Jesus resurrected. In chapter 4, Paul has described two great blessings given by God, forgiveness and justification. But this forgiving and justification adds the provision. But then you need to want it for yourself. Did I explain myself? These two blessings are obtained only through faith in Jesus. Why we need to put our faith in Jesus? In verse 25, Paul gives us the answer. First, it is Jesus who was delivered over to death on the cross in order that we ourselves might not have to bear the punishment for our sin. Jesus died in order that we might receive forgiveness. All right? Second, Jesus rose from the dead in order that we might be declared righteous. Having been declared righteous, we receive salvation and acceptance in the kingdom of God. What is the most important thing about Jesus' work on our behalf? His perfect life. Do you think it's, uh, it's important? Yes. He's dead on the cross. Do you think it's important? Yes. His resurrection, you think it's important? Yes. Or his intercession in the heavenly sanctuary. What of them is more important? All of them are important. All of them. All right? Those who say that the cross, the cross of Jesus is the most important thing, I fully agree. But for me, all the steps of Jesus in the plan of salvation are important. Conclusion, we need to be sure that we repent and confess our sin and we trust in Jesus and we need to be baptized. I understand that. Jesus now is our mediator, our advocate, an intercessor in heaven and take our sin and place them in the heavenly sanctuary covered by his blood. As soon as our sin enters in the heavenly sanctuary, Covered by the blood of Jesus, we have nothing to worry about. All right? We have nothing to worry about. If we truly have fellowship with Jesus, we will walk in the light. We will speak the truth. All right? The truth is not something one speaks. Truth is something one does and lives. 
if we must lead by the truth, we need to shout and sing because Jesus is all the world to us. Do you agree? Do you believe in Jesus? Stand up. Huh? Say it here in front because we know there are angels here taking notes. I know them. Stand up if you really believe in the Lord Jesus. And then you want the benefit for you. And then you want to study, you want to learn, you need to reconsecrate your life. You want to say, Lord, I want to be used. I want to make the decision to follow you no matter what. We are going to sing now, Jesus is all the world to us. I put us, but then he said, Jesus is all the world to me. Uh, that's what this is said in the 